Welcome to the Community Outreach and Engagement Skill Building Session. Today we're going to be talking about a little bit about what is community engagement, how to maximize your community outreach, and strengthening your marketing strategy. These are all in relation to the criteria that are found in the statewide community regrant grant opportunities for 2023, administered by the Huntington Arts Council and funded by the New York State Council on the Arts. Before we get started, I'd like to say welcome and thank you for joining us today. I would like to begin by acknowledging that we are gathered on the traditional and unceded territory of the Nisiquag and Mackinac people. We come with respect for this land that we are on today and for the people who have and do reside here. My name is Patty L. Hayek. I am the Grants Assistant for Huntington Arts Council and I'm very happy to be here with you today. Taken directly from the New York State Council on the Arts Criteria and Priorities. I just wanna give you a little explanation and a little background on the focus of this particular grants opportunity. So those of you that have been with us before, I'm sure you're aware of this and those of us, those of you that are new, welcome. And here's a little background on what NISCA is focusing on when we talk about community in particular. NISCA embraces the widest spectrum of cultural expression and artistic pluralism and encourages funded organizations to demonstrate a holistic and comprehensive commitment to DEIA, diversity, equity, inclusion, and access. NISCA interprets underrepresented communities as including but not limited to African American, Caribbean, Latino, Hispanic, Asian Pacific Islander, Middle Eastern, Native American, Indigenous communities, people in geographically remote areas, disabled communities, LGBTQIA communities, neurodiverse communities, vulnerable aging populations, veterans, low income and unhoused population populations, as well as justice involved juveniles and adults. So as you can see, there is a very specific, although it's wide ranging, very specific uh, criteria involved in the designation of communities underrepresented, communities that NISCA is wanting these uh, grants to focus on. So let's ask ourselves, how am I as an individual artist or an organization addressing this criteria? First, let's talk about the difference between outreach and engagement. So community outreach involves providing professional services or services of a specific expertise to a group of people who may not otherwise have access to those services. It is performed where those in need are located. For example, a concert series focusing on Hispanic composers in a predominantly Latino neighborhood. Community engagement, on the other hand, is a strategic process with the specific purpose of working with identified groups of people, whether they are connected by geographic location, special interests, or affiliation, to identify and address issues affecting their well being. For example, establishing an arts program for youth at a community center for historically underserved population. In short, community outreach is more short term, it is uh, driven by marketing. What can A do for B? One group will benefit most. It is transactional and directional. Whereas community engagement is more long-term. It's about building relationships. What can A and B do together? The whole community benefits, they connect, and it is cyclical. So it is something that can repeat. Uh, for many of you, if you are a affiliated with an organization, community engagement will be something that you are doing um, always as part of your mission statement, as part of what you do in the community. For individual artists, community outreach may be a little more direct, especially for this grant opportunity, since you will be focusing on come, going into partnerships with organizations to do some of these things that we say right here. So why community outreach? Artistic and cultural activities can be used to engage the public more fully in planning practices. That's why such as promoting stewardship of place, preserving cultural heritage and transmitting cultural values and history, bridging cultural, ethnic, and racial differences, and creating group memory and identity. All of the proposals, um, their driving force should be artistic in nature. And we all know why the arts are important, but in order to reach the community, it's not enough to know why the arts are important. It's not enough to try and convince people that the arts are important what we need to do is to reach those communities to find out what kinds of programming they are looking for that are perhaps missing, what communities are not being um, you know, uh, 
set aside and 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 catered to and actually involved in the process of creating programming and projects. So with that, arts participation is the end, but outreach strategies is the means. That's how we get there. That's how we get the butts and seats, as they say. So we need to start at the beginning. It is important to understand that programming is not just about what you or your organization gets excited about. If you are not including the community you serve, then is your mission really being fulfilled? right? We all have amazing ideas. They're all wonderful. And I'm sure that most communities would love to see your ideas um, manifested. But what's really important is what is my community interested in, specifically for this grant? The only way to find this out is to engage with the people you want to reach and ask them. This is something that should be ongoing. Um, there are a couple of ways that you can do that. Here are just some examples. Use free tools like Google Forms to poll your membership base. And of course, that is something that is um, directly related to an organization and is quite easy to do. Engage with the community on social media. And that is something that individual artists and organizations can also do. You can do polls on Instagram, on your own private Instagram or your organization's Instagram or your artist Instagram to ask people what kind of things they'd like to see. You can ask them if the ideas that you have in mind are something that's interesting. People love to give their opinions. And um, and it's really important that you that you find that out. Research other organizations and find out what other kinds of programming are being offered. This is really important too because you want to make sure what is popular, what is missing, right? Um, with all due respect, we all have lots of wonderful, beautiful watercolor classes and exhibits and uh, concert series and all these lovely things that are happening all over the island in Nassau and Suffolk counties. There's a lot of them. What is missing? And even within those that programming, what is missing within that programming that you as an individual artist or organization can really provide for these communities? And finally, invite community members to share their ideas, suggestions, and concerns. People like to be heard. Who am I serving? So as you are designing your programs, your projects, consider the following questions. Who should your program serve? Keep the priorities of this grant in mind. The criteria is not for a generalized population. NISCA grants are specific in their focus on underserved communities, whether related to gender, economics, or language, et cetera. Just as we said in the one of the first slides. What are the needs of this audience or demographic? How will you determine this? How can these needs be met? What is the best way for this community to access your program or project? And what does the outcome look like when it occurs? One thing that we don't really talk about a lot is evaluation and assessment. And that is just as important to understand the public impact your programming is making in the community. For our criteria for our rubrics this year for 2023, we do include a rubric for each grant category that specifically um, separates the components of a grant and public impact is one of those things that we are looking at how does it happen has it ha is it happening in your proposal how are you going to measure that i'm going to be showing you some examples of that as we move forward um when we talk a little bit about assessment and we're going to go back to assessment in a couple of uh, frames but take the time to learn about the community you serve um, I always say, look at the census data to understand the demographics of your service area. Although, you know, census is a little tough because it is self-reporting. And as we all know, that might not be, you know, people see themselves a certain way that maybe other people don't see them. So the census can at least give you an idea of the kind of community that you're living in or the kind of community that you are going to be presenting your work to. Make a list of key community leaders, groups, public services, and businesses. Um, adapt your materials. So develop marketing and educational materials in different languages to effectively reach out to different ethnic groups within your community. Partner with a local community group to assist with the translation of materials. This is really super important. Um, as someone who was born in South America, I was born in Colombia, the Spanish that I speak is not exactly the Spanish that other Hispanics or Latinos speak. Therefore, even with between us, we have miscommunication and different vocabulary. 
Um, just as dialects differ in the U.S., so do languages differ among countries, regions, etc. In Spanish, as in many languages, there is a formal version and an informal version. In order to reach as many people as possible, it is important to keep translations informal so they can be understood by the majority of people for whom English is a second language. You don't want to be using academic or formal or archaic language um, when you want to reach the widest net of people that you want. Partnering with a community group or individuals that can translate your message is the best choice. In lieu of that, finding a translation platform online is acceptable. However, that too should be vetted by a native speaker because of the variety of translation options available. And beyond this, what's really behind this is what is your intent? What is your intent at providing um, your flyers, your uh, posts, your social media posts, um, your posters in a different language. Um, if it is to bring that community to you, then you want to make sure that you are giving them the proper respect and the proper language to use. Um, did you know that in Word, Word, actually Microsoft Word, you can actually translate and choose the country that you're translating so that you can be very as specific as possible, at least as specific as Microsoft Word provides for you, um, that translation. And even then though, there are, it is a formal translation. So just keep that in mind. Um, and again, that's another way to really learn more about your community is to look for someone to translate um, your marketing materials for you. And they can also help you reach those people that you want to reach. So here are some outreach strategies. Uh, reframe what's difficult. Rather than framing groups as hard to reach and excluding them for lack of time, resources, or other reasons, many of you, your artists, you have other jobs, your organizations that are mainly volunteer. So we understand that it is another layer of uh, work that has to be done, but it is part of the process. Flip that and ask, why do we find it difficult to hear these groups? This reframe may help you plan more strategically and properly allocate resources for a more inclusive process from the start. So I'm gonna give you an example uh, from the Arts Center at Duck Creek. And of course, this is something that, you know, you can't go back in time and start this, but this is um, an example of an organization that does something from this, that did something from the start. The Art Center at Duck Creek is at its core a community project. It was established as a 501c3 by a group of local residents who spearheaded its restoration and adaptation to an art center, which is free and open to all. The property and programming of the art center at Duck Creek are now managed by this group of lo local residents. So they are stakeholders in their community. Stakeholders are anybody in the community or organization who are either impacted by the project or have a vested interest in it. Each of these stakeholders are also capable of influencing the community. So your community engagement strategy should plan on the best way to involve them in your efforts. Some ways to do that are getting involved with or speaking to local residents or area-based groups, faith-based groups, racial, ethnic, and cultural groups, local community and volunteer groups, web-based or virtual groups, and communities of interest. Consider intersectionality. We often hear about inequalities that have resulted from the pandemic, but in many cases, these inequities already existed and have been further exacerbated because of the pandemic. We're all in the same storm, but we are not all in the same boat. It may not be so easy for children to come and see your program if the school has to spend money on bus and transportation, which is very expensive. Not only that, but the scheduling of something is crucial, especially in creative learning um, grant opportunities because of the children's schedule, the admin schedule, the school schedule, and parents' schedules. So um, it is something to really understand that that we are not all able to uh, be present the way we want to be present. And so we have to figure out a way to be as inclusive as possible in our proposals and in our work to be able to bring our programs to as many people as possible. Here is a sample from a 2022 Creative Communities grant proposal that shows some of these community outreach efforts and how they plan to manifest them. 
So the predominantly Hispanic population will be connected with the pre and post concert engagement activities to introduce children to the musicians and their instruments. We plan to have interpreters for a clear line of communication and to avoid language barriers. Collaborating with local civic groups and schools, we will continue our partnership with Long Island Cares, the Harry Chapin Food Bank, to support local food pantries with our Bring a Can to the Car Concert campaign. Special accommodations are offered to the disabled. Our popular live streaming service on social media was enhanced in 2021 with the addition of high quality video and post-production editing of each concert published on social media, providing global access to audience members unable to attend. Seating and parking is reserved for seniors and disabled concert goers. Programs are designed for easy reading and are posted online. This year, we added a QR code to view our programs right on a smartphone. Each piece is explained before being performed, thus providing context, history, and some interesting musical trivia. By staging free weekday after-school performances, we can reach many children in the local community and their families who would otherwise have no or limited access to live music and arts education. To maximize participation by these families, we will liaise with local community centers to promote and coordinate participation. As many of the underserved families we hope to target are part of the Latino community, we plan to include live Spanish language translation of parts of the performances. We will also promote the project through both English and Spanish publicity materials and ensure it is promoted throughout the community with posters and minority owned non-English speaking businesses. So as you can see, they've really touched on quite a few different forms of community outreach here from collaborating with local civic groups and schools having special accommodations, um, seating and reserve seating for people who may need it. Um, this is, I thought was really, really a wonderful um, way to show that they are actually bringing their program to the community as opposed to expecting the community to come to them. They're after school, they can reach, as they say, many more children and families and liaison again, liaising with community centers to promote and, commu and coordinate participation is wonderful because now you've got an audience of families and children that would love to be a part of this. Instead of having them come to you, you go to them. Um, promoting the, uh, the project through English and Spanish publicity materials, super important, like we talked about translations, but also, and I know this is difficult because I've I've been part of this before. It is difficult to go to businesses and ask them to put, you know, posters in their windows or leave postcards on their counters, but somebody will let you do it. And even if it's only one business that lets you do it, it gives you, again, a connection. You start building that relationship in the community. And that's one more person that you didn't have before. So it's always willing. It's always good to take a shot. Let's move on. This is an example of some social media posts. Now, social media, everyone asks about social media. Um, social media is, is tricky. There's a lot of questions about it. That's an entire session all on its own. But I just wanted to give you some examples of, once again, this is a restart, um, a restart community grant that was funded last year. And I just wanted to give you an example of how she promoted her um, her program on social media because I thought it was really great. Uh, this is her first one of her one of her first posts, and as you can see, there is a flyer here, and there is a video of her speaking about the program that she's doing. What I really want you to focus on is that she is giving you exactly the date. See you this Saturday, July 30th at 4 p.m. at Westbury's Yes We Can Center. There'll be poetry, storytelling, improv improvisation, music, information, and more. She names the people that are going to be working with her, her collaborators, David Morales, social worker, expert in migration, Luciano Taro, Latin Moms Connect. This is their tagline for their organization. Auspicious by Fidelis Care, that's another sponsor. So she has, not only is she talking about her program, but she's talking about all of the people that have collaborated to make this possible for her to bring this program to you. And that is really, really important. Tagging people, adding them by saying at and tagging them. This is an Instagram post, by the way, that was shared on Facebook. 
And um, and it was originally in Spanish, as you can see, it's the original rate, this translation. So the original was in Spanish, translated into English for Instagram and Facebook. Here are her next two posts, now July 31st. This is during, it actually looks like the very beginning before the program started. She has her setup. She's showing her collaborators once again. Thank you at Latina Moms Connect for your support during our program. July was Minority Mental Health Awareness Month. So she tied her program to Mental Health Awareness Month. And she used the arts as a way to explore these uh, themes of mental health. She goes on to talk about our culture is beautiful. Our heritage is one that many wonderful things that make us who we are. However, there are cultural benefits and misconceptions that we can shift to better serve our children and ourselves. She's not just talking about what's happening in the program. She's talking about why she did this and what it's going to address. She also adds the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, the Nassau County Behavioral Health Awareness Campaign Helpline, Long Island Crisis Center, so she's adding resources. She's not just talking about this amazing program that's happening, but she's adding resources for people to extend the life of her programming and to connect it to something that's really, really important in the community that she's serving. And then her one of her last posts on August 2nd, thank you, Jennifer Martinez, Long Island News, for your support of our past the Mount the, the mind mental event featuring poetry stories and paintings about mental health so she got some press which is fantastic infinite thanks to all those who sit present fidelis care latina moms connect again tagging and mentioning the people that were collaborating with her very important people like to be acknowledged and we like to acknowledge them too so um this is a wonderful example of how social media can be used as a tool not just before, whoops, went too far. Hang on. Oh, I went too far. Hold on one second. Uh, technology, it's a wonderful thing. Just give me one second. Let me go back here. There we go. Okay, and we're back. Not just starting to get people interested in the event that's that's going to occur during the event while it's happening, but most importantly, sometimes after the event is over to let people know this is what happened. It was amazing. Thank you to all these people and what actually happened at your event and what's coming next. As I say, just do it. Presentations, reach out to key community groups and leaders. Ask if you can present at a meeting, learn about what different groups in your community are doing and how you can partner with them. As you saw in Adriana's posts, she had partnerships with Fidelis Care, Latina Moms, um fidelis that's one way to do that reach out to them and ask them work with local media partner with the local newspaper to get a featured article or recurring column advertise events and volunteer opportunities on your local public access channel reach out to local radio stations about your outreach events the one thing about social media is that content content is king people need content because it's we have our news now 24 seven. So do not be afraid to come to them with an idea or not just for promotion for your program because everyone wants to do that, right? But come to them with an idea before that promotion, that time that for that promotion. This way you've built again a relationship with them so that you can continue to share your work with them. Participate in community events, staff a table at community fair, participate in community events. You should have a record of community engagement before grant season. The more your community members see you, the more familiar they will become with your organization. And don't forget, when you um, when you propose this grant, uh, this grant idea, this is what you are proposing it. It may change as you are actually implementing your grant. There may not be, everything does not have to be set in stone before you propose it. The more you have ready, the more commitments you have from collaborators and from uh, you know sponsors or anything like that is better, of course, but this isn't going to be an ongoing project that you are going to 
implement at the end. So if you don't have everything in place, that's okay. But we do need to see a plan of what you hope will be in place by the time that you begin to implement your programming. Here's an example. Here's a marketing plan sample from a 2022 creative learning grant proposal. To par properly market the event, it'll be important to follow an event marketing timeline. Calls for artists would be the first announcement. 10 weeks prior to the event, create a pre-event ad, social media announcement, and blog. Design flyer and poster to be printed, create event registration page. Eight weeks prior to the event, follow up with event launch, press release, partnerships, social media advertisement, event postcards and flyers, paid promotion social media ad. Also send out invites for specific community members, organizations, such as the school district, town executives, and other officials, local art schools, and organizations. Six weeks prior to the event, share social media ads with other groups, organizations, and individuals. Make additional social media post stories announcing each individual artist and event participant. Four weeks prior to the event, continue promotion through social media, printed flyers and postcards, working hand in hand with event partners and sharing all promotional material. During the last two weeks prior to the event, additional ad, announcement of registration closure across social media, Final blog post and story to attract last minute attendees, plan and schedule social content to go out during the event. So as you can see, this is a very clean, to the point schedule of what they plan to do to promote and market their programming. Do not be afraid to, to uh, 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 approach media outlets, newspapers, um, other organizations, you know, for sponsorship, for assistance. Although this grant as an organization and as an artist, you are the person applying for this grant. Therefore, you are responsible for the marketing. I know that um, many people, their community partners are wonderful and they share their social media, they share their printing. They, You might be working with a library that puts your program in the newsletter, which is absolutely fantastic but that cannot be the only form of marketing that you are relying on for your programming. Because for example, if you're working with a library, you that grant is going to you in your name. You are the person that's responsible for marketing this program. And you are the person that's responsible for bringing people into the library for this program. That's why the library is partnering with you too, to open themselves up to perhaps a different community that they may not be familiar with through your programming. So it is, you have to work together, okay? You can't just rely on them to do it. Um, also, there was something else on here I wanted. I mean, you don't have to make a blog if you don't want to, but there is no getting around social media promotion in 2022 or 2023. Um, posters, flyers, all the range of marketing platforms that you can follow, the better. Um, they say that it takes at least eight times for someone to see something on social media or in the media for them to actually notice it. So this is a great example of all of these, um, you know, this work being put into it to make sure that people are seeing this event and that it's going to happen. So we talked a little bit about assessment before, let's go back to that. So the public impact, um, which is part of this grant, the assessment, the evaluation, what does the outcome look like when it occurs and how do you know it has happened? So some typical outcomes might be stated like this. This is my, when you write your grant proposal, what is my public impact? How am I going to do that? What is my end goal for this? Students participating in the artist in residency program will be able to create original illustrations based on lessons in their core curriculum. An after school theatrical improvisation workshop will result in improved self esteem among participating teens. Interactive interpretive materials in a museum gallery will result in longer visitor stays and greater retention of educational information. So these are all very specific outcomes that have been written in grant proposals that the um, the applicants are hoping to achieve with this programming. Here are a few sources for gathering data on your programs, artwork or performances presented by participants, class rubrics, participant interviews or personal reflections, comment book, guest book or exit interview, 
organizational records, taking attendance, annual reports for organizations, community assessments, and strategic plans for organizations. Um, your grant documentation, your proposal, your review panel comments and scores, and your final reports, all of those are for you to see how well your program did. Um, we do provide grant panel comments for all the grants that are reviewed, whether you are funded or not. And you can get those from us once the uh, funding notifications have gone out. And please do remember to call us and find out, hey, what were my comments? What did people say about my grants? Not only if you didn't get funded, but almost more importantly, if you did, because you want to know what is it that tip them over to give you that funding. You know, what did you do right? You have to know what you did right. You have to know what you did wrong too. So, well, not wrong, but maybe what didn't work as well. Okay. Um, also taking attendance at your, um, at your events is extremely important because we do require that for our final reports. We need to know how many people approximately how many people came to your events. We also need to know how many artists you are compensating or are working with you in your grant proposal. So those are two things that are really, really important. Um, having a comment book, a guest book for events um, to have people give you their comments and tell you how much they liked it or what they didn't like either, which is also important, right? Maybe what was a challenge for them. Um, that is really important. We'd love to see that in your final report, but more so for yourself so that you understand how your program did in terms of public impact. For creative learning, we are actually providing you this year with a classroom teacher evaluation form, which you are going to give to the classroom teacher that you are partnering with for them to complete. And you will have to hand that in with your final report so that we can see an assessment of the program as well. And we're also providing you with exit cards that you can use on your own. You can make as many copies as you like and use them however you like to, uh, to poll your students to find out what is it about your program that they really like. Um, and that's more so for your own, um, for your own assessment to know how you're, how you're doing, right? And what you need to work on or what's working really well. Um, and in conclusion, words matter. To achieve your goals, you, your nonprofit, or your group must adopt and consistently use inclusive language. Here are some, um, some links and some resource links, and some of these are already up at our website that you can go to, HuntingtonArts.org, click on the Programs tab, Long Island Grants for the Arts, and you'll see the drop-down menu with um, all of the information that we have there for you already. The last link is for SER resources and that's where you'll find this as well as this recording and everything else um, that we have for you. So I hope that this was um, an informative uh, presentation and I wanna encourage everyone to please reach out to Emily Dowd, um, edowd at huntingtonarts.org. Uh, the grants coordinator, as well as myself, Patty L. Hayek, P E L J A I E K, at HuntingtonArts.org, um, to speak to us about your proposals, your ideas. We are here to assist you in this experience. And um, as many of you know who've written grants before, that is not something that is no the norm in grant writing. So please take advantage of us. That's what we're here for. And we're really looking forward to meeting you and hearing more about what you're going to be doing next year in 2023. Thank you so much.